Hey, Angela, welcome to the show. Good morning, good morning. How are you today? So good. It's what, 2.30 for you right now in the morning? It is. It's, yeah, that 2.30 mark here because I live over in Australia. So yes, but I do believe if you want something bad enough, you just make it happen. So time, time doesn't matter. It just you work itself out. You're a champ. So thank you for waking up in the middle of the night. For <laughs> yes, really. no worries. I'm like, You're like awesome. I said, You're awesome. happy so, to be here. Yeah. Just tell us, how did you get started entrepreneurship? What's your story? Yeah, so once my little one, Finley, he's now almost 10, or almost 11, sorry, when he was one years old, I just remember playing with him on the ground, and I just looked at these toys that he had, and they were all electronic toys, which don't get me wrong, I think we all have technology in our house some way, somehow, but I just remember going, all these toys are doing the work for Finn, and I thought, there's got to be something more than this, and then that's when I started researching different educational toys for children, and started to just bring in different toys from around the world. And so obviously we started with zero toys. And then at one stage we got up to 1400 different baby products. And that was through my first business, Finley and Me, where we really focused on creating childhood memories through play, love and travel, uh, which was a brilliant opportunity. We started out going to markets then we started going to trade fairs. Uh, then we grew online. From there, I also realized that it's always good to have different monetary streams of income coming in. And so I then started blogging because I thought, if you've got a bad month in this, what's going to happen? As I also know, you know, you blog also, uh, you use Pinterest also. And so that's what we started to utilize too. And from there, I became one of Australia's leading parenting bloggers. I was signed with uh, Netflix as one of their top 30 bloggers here in Australia. And then I worked with kind of big brands over here in Australia, similar to say like Walmart, Target, etc. over in the United States and then other international brands too. So that's where my journey first started and then it just evolved into the Angela Anderson Consulting over time. Amazing. Okay. So you've had quite the experience over the years. That was like in a little nutshell. What are some of the lessons that you learned through growing Finley and Me? The biggest lesson with Finley and me from an e-commerce perspective was that really think about third-party logistic companies before you hand everything over. Uh, everyone made it out like it was going to be so easy and so smooth sailing and just rock and roll with it, but it's actually quite expensive third-party logistics if you're not making your own product lines. Um, and if you have multiple, like again, we had 1,400 different products at one stage. So when you've got 1,400 different products, some of those products are filler products. So you go there to help with your SEO juice or to be found in other avenues. Um, and so if they don't churn over as quickly as other products might, what ends up happening is then you're paying for shelf time and it eats into your profit margins. So third party logistics was an absolute nightmare for us. Um, so that was my number one lesson from an e-com. But my overall lesson that I learned is about the importance of paying to play. And that I wish I would have done it earlier on is at the beginning, it's you, you're kind of bootstrapping things for a lot of time. And I didn't invest in myself as quickly as I should have. So it wasn't until around, oh, I'm just trying to think, I started you know, investing in $10, say conferences, then $20 conferences, and then $100 tickets and so forth. But then I really doubled down back in 2015, 2016, when I went to my big mastermind with Chris Ducker over in the Philippines. And it was there where everything started to shift very, very quickly and new opportunities came about. So I realized when you start to pay to play with people who've already been there and done it, your business will grow exponentially because you are around people who are, are firing at a much higher level than you. Uh, I love being, as I say, the dumbest person in any room because you just absorb absolutely everything from these legends. So my overall lesson from Finley and me and now moving in with Angela Henderson Consulting over the last few years is definitely you, you need to pay to play. For sure. So was it comfortable to make that big investment to work with Chris Ducker and join that mastermind? No, like it was physically you just want to vomit, right? Because you're just yes. like, oh my good, oh my goodness, and I, am I going to see the ROI in this? And I just remember I flew into the Philippines three days before the actual event. So Chris Ducker's event is or was he no longer does it anymore? Was this beautiful event where there was 50 people only attendees that were able to go. And then it was also, you had nine speakers from around the world, which is just like some of the top speakers from around the world. And then it's just like this immersion. And we then are sitting there like in the pool, 
with the speakers, drinking mojitos, playing beach ball or playing volleyball in the pool. And actually it's funny because most people have this assumption that you go to these particular type of events and you're going to learn so much like actually like sitting down. But the growth actually happened when we were at dinner, when we were on a catamaran, when we were in the pool drinking mojitos. So it was just this beautiful experience. But I remember being there like day two, even before the event had started and the amount of information I'd already gotten just from the attendees, I was mind blown. And I knew then that the ROI wouldn't be far behind. For sure. Oh my goodness. Like that's one of the things that was so intentional about this past year was in really surrounding myself with millionaires and being mm -hmm. like, where do I want to be? Where does my business want to be? Like, and how can I get around people who are way smarter than me, <laughs> you know, cause that's how you're going to grow. Right. 100% like I just know like I feel like I'm the one that kind of my hands always up like ooh another question ooh another question ooh another question but it's like I just am going well if I'm going to pay this much money I don't want to be the smartest person and get nothing from it so it is an uncomfortable feeling but where I believe wherever you are uncomfortable growth happens the magic starts to happen so I've learned to embrace the uncomfortable over the years so true. I love how you said you like, we're going to throw up a little bit. Cause that's what I tell <laughs> my clients. I'm like, if you don't feel like you're going to throw up just a little bit, then you're not playing big enough. And I've had some of my students as they sign up for my program activate, like it's an investment to work with me in that program. And they're like, I think I'm going to throw up. I think I'm going to throw up. And I'm like, good. Like, this is a stretch for you. Exactly guys. right. This is a stretch and you're going to grow like crazy over the next year. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. It, it's there's just something in your fire and you, you just have to trust the process. Obviously, I never want people just to go and throw away. I mean, copious amounts of money and they're not going to be able to feed their family or anything like that. Totally. But if you can truly feel that uncomfortableness, know that nothing's going to be compromised and that it's going to, you know, you're going to rock and roll, you'll be fine. But I also say, you know, when my, my one to one coaching clients somewhat sign up with me or, you know, also my mastermind is I say to them something like, they'll say, well, what's my ROI when working with you? And I just have to gently remind them that their ROI, their failure and success is up to them. Yeah. I will be there to guide them and nurture them, but how quickly are they going to take action? How much money do they have to invest in, in say SEO, a conversional website, great graphics, a Pinterest strategist, whatever it is that we're looking at for their business collectively. So a lot of times people will try and push that back on me, but the reality of it is people's yeah, failures and successes are totally up to them. For sure. Okay. So you talk a lot about human to human marketing. Can you talk mm. about what is that? <laughs> Yeah, so what I found, in my opinion, over the years, there's a lot of B2B and B2C. And I kind of feel like it's either you're this or you're that, especially kind of in that e-com space. But what I found over time is when I lead with value first, uh, when I lead with treating them as a human being first, magic happens. And so with human to human marketing is really, it's, it pertains to the experience and interaction one has with a particular brand. So again, key thing is, is the experience and the interaction that one has. When you're in that B2B and B2C, it's just kind of like do this and give you the money or do this and have the transaction. So you might have an interaction with a brand, but you might not have this really juicy experience or you might have an, um, an experience, but there's not like a, there's not minimal interaction. You're like, oh, that was fun. A little bit of interaction. But in order to really have that human to human marketing, it's the experience and interaction one has with a particular brand. And an example that I use is when I was pregnant with Finley, like I said, now if he's almost 11, almost 12 years ago, I remember going to this beautiful cafe here in Brisbane called Tognini's. And I was, when I first started going there when I was pregnant, obviously they didn't know I was pregnant, but I was craving these beautiful, big, juicy raspberry muffins. And I am a bit, my weakness is Diet Coke. So I had one of these almost every day for kind of like the, the first, once I got out of that third trimester. So they would greet me, hello, how are you? And then over time I was like, hi Angela, how are you? And I was like, oh my goodness, how far along are you? And then when Finley came, they started asking a variety of questions about Finley. And it was, a, it was, an experience and interaction every single touch point that I would have with these beautiful owners of the Italian cafe. And over time, as I now live 20 minutes one way to this particular cafe, so 40 minute return trip, and we still go there two to three times a week. The muffins cost me more than anywhere else that I could get locally. I'm using more petrol than or petrol gas, as you guys say in the United States, than I normally would be. And 
but it's like you want to keep going back because of the interaction and experience I have that my children have every single time. And the muffins, if I'm 100% honest, um, honest, they're not as great as they used to be. I think they're cutting me out here with some raspberries or blueberries when I go there, but it doesn't matter because it's just this warm, juicy welcome that you get every time you go there. I love it. So you've lived in a lot of different places. Do you think that human to human experience is going to be different depending on the country? Listen, I've, this is something that I've been asked a few times and my, my answer there is, is obviously culturally, yes, you're going to need to take in sensitivities and just the, it is the way it is. There are some male more dominant countries and then you know females have to listen to rules and norms and things like that. But for the most part, if you treat people like human beings, you treat them not like a transaction, things are going to be amazing. What I will say though is here in Australia, we like to do things a little bit different. And with our some of the data that was released back in March this year, is what they did say is, is that Aussies behind France are the least trusting countries in the world. Yeah. And so from a marketing perspective, what they talk about there is in this particular um, uh, study that they did is that we have less trust than a lot of other countries, which means when you're trying to convert a client, you're going to need multiple touch points, even more so. And we see this, I see this also as when I work with the Americans and Canadians, the, our, the way our sales page are set up, it's, it, the transaction happens a lot quicker. Whereas when here in Australia, you've got to warm people a little bit more. They've kind of got the barometer up about like, are you, you really tell me the truth? Can I trust you? Can I not trust you? So though I go human to human marketing is the same as in treating humans to humans. The fact is in Australia, our trust factor and in France, we sit as the below countries there. Uh, you do, you need more touch points. So you do have to think about that when you're, when you're doing your marketing. And that's the beauty of human to human is if you're creating those experiences in those interactions with your ideal client, they're more likely to convert than just considering just, you know, here's some stuff, buy it. Got it. So how would this human to human marketing look from like a sales process perspective? If you're trying to sell something high ticket or even just an online course, how would they be different? So the way I look at a traditional sales process is you've got the prospect, you then potentially qualify this particular lead, you present to them whatever you're offering, and then from there you're overcoming objections, you're closing, you're following up, and you may have a little element of customer service. And I say may, because a lot of people don't do the follow-up customer service really well at all. But again, over my decade of, of almost being in business is I've read this beautiful book called The Go-Givers. And The Go-Givers are very much about adding value first and have human, beautiful uh, elements of human to human marketing. And when they look at a sales process, they're all about creating value first, touch people's lives, build networks, be real, stay open, become profitable. And that's how I lead when I'm looking at any of my clients that are coming in is in my Facebook community, um, on the podcast, when I do my live events, et cetera, is how can I create value versus looking at them at a prospect and qualifying them. I'm really looking at how am I creating value, touching their lives, building the networks, being real, staying open, and ultimately becoming profitable. So that's what I've kind of found. And it wasn't until I read the book, The Go-Givers, that I was able to really understand that there was a two different sales processes going on. Interesting. Okay. So what are you doing specifically in your business to really implement this? So, yeah, so there's a lot of times that people will say to me, my own mentors over the last a couple of years is they say that I show up too frequently in my free Facebook community and that I'm spending too much time there. And I don't disagree that I was spending some time there. So we made changes. I've got a community manager, but the number one thing that people have said to me when I'm interviewing them in uh, discovery calls or when they sign with me with clients is that I show up. And the analogy I use is like a seagull. The majority of online business owners that I have seen with that have these Facebook communities is that they go in, you always know when it's launch time, every single time. You never hear from them. They might throw a few little funny memes up, do you know I mean, to kind of keep the group going. That's kind of it. But then all of a sudden the seagull comes. The seagull comes in, shits the launch stuff into the Facebook group, and then the seagull leaves once launch is done. All right? Now, if that works for people, that's fine. But the difference in that where I'm going with a human to me is I'll still show up in my free Facebook community, not just during launch time, but collectively all around. I still show up. I ask questions. I'm present. I'm adding value. I'm treating them like human beings and not as transactions. 
I also have been told multiple times that I need to completely outsource my sales process uh, when I get on and qualify people to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. My thing is, is if I walk into Mercedes and it is, and I'm going to buy a $400,000 car or into BMW or wherever I'm going to buy these expensive cars, you don't walk in and say, can you just package that $400,000 car up, put a little ribbon on it. I don't really need to know how it works how it fires off, anything like that. Just like wrap it up. You don't do that. You ask questions, you seek answers. You want to make sure the right fit. So one mastermind that I signed up with uh, this last year was, uh, it was a $20,000 mastermind. And the, the, and it was a red flag for me, if I'm 100% honest, is that they, I had, I was only able to speak with the sales team. And I'm like, if I'm dropping $20,000 for a mastermind, I would love to make sure that this person's the right fit. Like, is their persona on Facebook the same as it is face to face? Because a lot of people aren't who they're like when you meet them in real. So I did sign up with this person uh, and I should have followed my gut, right? So th that's how I'm showing up. I also, for all of my VIP coaching clients and my 12 month group coaching clients is I put time out every single week and I personally call them myself. So I know there might be some gasps going, oh my gosh, as people are listening to this or driving in their car right now. But the reality of it is, is these individuals will become my marketers for me. They go and because I've treated them so differently than the majority of everyone else. When I run, I run Australia's leading four day, three night women in business retreat. Granted in this particular instance, there's 50 people that come. I blocked out three hours, two weeks before the event back here in October and I rang every single person. The funny thing here is though, is the majority of people don't answer their phone. We just don't like, oh my gosh, that's a weird number. I'm just going to hit decline or hit it to voice messaging. So I probably only speak with about 30% of the people on the phone anyways. But then I get these beautiful messages from people going, you are the only person that I've ever bought anything from that has picked up the phone and had a conversation with me. And sometimes those conversations are two minutes, other times they're 10 minutes. But I tell you what, they, the retention for my clients just continue to stay, to stay, to stay. So those are a few examples how I do it. Um, another example is when my clients do come on, this is automated, I use Zapier for this particular part, is I ask them in their survey question, how long have they been in, in business? When did their business start? And what is the exact name of their business? And what we do is I then zap that to my designer and she creates this beautiful bamboo plaque with their business in the year it was established. And then that gets hung in their room versus sending them like a branded pen. So those are just a few of the little touch points that I've uh, infiltrated through uh, both Finley and me and through Angela Henderson Consulting uh, because I do believe that something's key that we're missing is that conversations equal conversions. And if people can remember that, you know, it's really simple three words, conversations equal conversions, you'll be amazed at what uh, your business can look like. Amazing. Okay. Questions. How much time do you spend doing this stuff? Cause I know a lot of my people are, you know, solopreneurs and they're like, Oh, this is just another thing I need to add to my plate. So how much time do you spend on all this? Yep. So again, automating the gifts that's just automated from the minute that we, once they finish their survey, that's all completely done in I regards like to getting, <laughs> yep. So that's good. And it's still personal, right? And that's a big difference is it's not, it's, I'm not sending them something that's branded with me because that's just me boosting my stuff. I'm taking time to understand their business and journey and they're less likely to throw that particular bamboo plaque out because it's about them right in their experience and their journey uh, I spend anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half a week making any if it, any of those phone calls with any of the new clients uh, but again it's it's how long do you want to be in business for? What, what are your core values? How are you sticking out and being different from other people? How, how do you want that to look post? So it does take an hour to an hour and a half of my time. But remember, I've also grown a lot. So if I was a solopreneur and having to do everything and I wouldn't have had as many clients, it may have taken me some days 30 or some weeks, 30 minutes, right? But as you grow, you're also going to outsource other tasks. Yep. And I remember interviewing um, another individual on my own podcast, but she was talking about Jasmine Starr in the United States. And someone got up and was asking her about how she's able to manage doing her Instagram account because she responds to every message in her Instagram. And people are like, you know, how do you do it? I have 100,000 people and da, 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 da. And she goes, you do it. And they're like, but what do you mean? Like, we don't have time. She goes, you find time. 
outsource the other bits that don't need you and don't outsource the human bits. Mm -hmm. And people like, you know, and then this person just kept kind of questioning Jasmine a little bit more and a little bit more. And she's like, so, you know, but can I have my team do it? She goes, no, you do it treat them like humans. So I guess you really have to look at what's moving and what's working within your business yeah. and where you can outsource those little other tasks that you might be doing thinking they're so important and really, really embracing that human to human element. Okay. So question for the people who are you're calling that have bought something, is this like a $17 product or like what level? Yep. Yeah, yeah, great Everyone question. So, a, wait, so yes, or you talk, you, sorry, I'm no, gonna stop talk. <laughs> no, 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 like great question. So, my minimal product is a 12 month group coaching program, okay. and so that's a $1,500 product there. Uh, and then my one to one group coaching sits at about the $7,000 mark, and then my retreat ticket sits at $1,700. So, you still are looking at a minimum there of that you know $1,500 mark. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so. But to me, that's absorbed in my, in my budget there because to send one of those plaques, I think is $25, yeah. uh, but my retention rate is so much higher. So many of those people will then work with me and then they're buying uh, you know, a ticket to the retreat or then they go from working with my 12 month group coaching program into my uh, like higher ticket one-to-one -one, or they then uh, just open up my mastermind now or just recently also. So yeah, so it's a minimum of $1,500, but yeah, $25 to invest back into them is due to sure. me, I think is uh, yeah, an easy win for all. But for the one, so these are the people you're calling. Are you calling people, do you have any like lower priced courses or programs that you have that you're selling that you're calling those people or the minimum? So when, so, so the minimum, so even when I was starting, obviously these prices have gone up as I've been over like in over the years, but I've never had a $97 product that I was yeah. calling anyone on, right? Like $97 yeah. <laughs> to me or like an ebook, right? Like I'm not calling, I wouldn't be calling someone if they've got a freebie, for example. Right. Um, ebook, <laughs> yeah, the $97, ones like again I think we're the we're the high churn but anything out like even five hundred dollars right is five hundred dollars to a lot of people is the first biggest investment that they've ever made yeah. ever made yeah. so and then and it might be five hundred dollars for your product line now but then like what I did is that now it's a fifteen hundred dollar product so I think it's important to really go back and look at again then your product your suite of products figure out again what is viable for you to start doing this and then work backwards. Again, a $97 product, I would say no, because it's just like you, you would be on the phone all the time. But again, if you have a $97 product and that's like an upsell or something, uh, I'd be then looking at like, yeah, is, yeah, is your price too low? Maybe, I don't know. That's uh, yeah. Pricing is a whole nother conversation we could have also. Totally. Yeah. Cause I'm just wondering, I'm like, okay, I want to start like doing some of this stuff, but we have our $17 baby offer. And I'm like, could I call everyone that purchases $17? 17, $17. No, $17. I mean, I think it's like, but I would say the majority of those people, not like, I don't, I don't know your numbers, but I would suspect that a lot of those people will, will buy from you again at some point they in your do. buyer's journey. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yep. And then again, once they have that human touch point with you, like I'm telling you these people's like in my a uh, 12 month group coaching program, which has been running for 18 months. I've only just in the last two weeks refunded someone for the very first time. Wow. One time. Yeah. Right. So, uh, excuse me, as my nose is just running. Um, so, yeah, so one time um, to me, that is a strong indicator that when I get them on the phone within the first five days of purchase, and then they receive that beautiful plaque. Again, they're, they're kind of going, hey, she, she, she is actually investing in me. She, she believes in me. She's taking time out of her, her life for me. And so I, I would have to say that there's a direct correlation that what, what I'm doing reduces the overall refund and, and churn on that. Totally. No, I 100% believe that will. Um, what are the seven profit pillars business owners need to grow a sustainable and profitable business? So when we, one of the things that I've learned over the time of being in business is that um, most businesses come to me and they're made out of hay or they're made out of straw, kind of like the three little pigs, right? And that they're like kind of just, they're structurally there, but they're a the little bit wobbly and it wouldn't take too much for people to potentially, do you know what I mean, close up shop you know, file bankruptcy, whatever. And so over the last decade, I've come up with these seven profit pillars that you need in order to grow a sustainable, profitable business. And I find that there's a particular order that they need to go in because if you start running Facebook ads or Pinterest ads back to a website that isn't a conversional website, things are gonna go a little bit skew. 
So Profit Pillar 1 that I found is about creating your perfect profit profile. And that's about really understanding your ideal client, uh, validating your product, and then also looking at your own core values and what you stand for. Because if you don't have an understanding and grasp about your own core values, and if you don't understand your ideal client, and if you have a bad product, is uh, you're going to kind of be you know, uh, swimming up, do you know what I mean? Or uh, swimming up a hill that's never going to, like you're going to be, like you're going to be treading water for a very long time. So that's the first profit pillar that I said individuals that they need to really look at is understanding their perfect profit profile. The second thing that I found is that you do need to build a uh, profit ready website. And what I mean by that is you need to have a website that has clear messaging above the fold because we know you only have six seconds from the time someone lands on your website for you to tell them what you do and how you're going to solve their problem and what do they need to do that call to action. So many people get this wrong. They go, yeah, but my website looks so pretty. It doesn't matter if your website's pretty if it's not a conversional website. Yes, preach it. <laughs> Sorry. So yes, yeah, so you <laughs> need <head>. you need <laughs> the conversional website, um, and also on a conversional website, it's like that includes like how what is the speed of your website? It includes what are your short tail and long tail keywords, so your SEO on your website, because if your website is open twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, you need to make sure it's firing off at all angles so that you can continue to be profitable even when you sleep. So yes, profit pillar number two is you really need that conversional website, uh, because again, if you're running ads, if you're spending a thousand thousand dollars five thousand dollars ten thousand dollars in ads and you're driving people traffic back to a crappy website you're actually just wasting your ad spend because people don't know what to do when they get to your website yep that is profit pillar number two. Profit pillar number three is really looking at your, I call it the money maker map profit pillar, is you need to understand what your ecosystem is. How are you moving them from the free content, which could be a blog post, it could be a podcast, it could be uh, Pinterest, and whatever, and moving them into a lower ticket item to mid-range mid ticket item, and then over to you know your higher ticket. How are you moving them in that within that ecosystem? And if you don't have an understanding about that, then it's going to be really hard because you're not then looking at potentially setting them up in particular sales funnels. So it's really about understanding where you're going to be focusing those marketing energies. What does that content plan look like and how are you moving them within the ecosystem? And then profit number, pillar number four, so many people continue to try people that say that email list building is dead. I still am so against this. Email, email list building is profit pillar number four because it's not just about short-term game, it's about long-term game. I know when I had Fidley and me, we had over 50,000 uh, subscribers that were active on our list. And when we were looking at selling the business, we knew that it was an asset roughly going about $4 per email lead. So if you do $4 times 50, thousand people on your email list. It's about building this as a long-term asset. But if you're not building your email list and you're playing on other people's property like Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, etc., they can shut you down at any particular time. And I've seen this over and over and over again is people are building these beautiful businesses on other people's land and then they lose it. So profit pillar four is you really need to be building that email list. So yes, profit pillar number uh, five is that you've got this beautiful email list and so many people come to me and then they say, oh, yeah, I've got 10,000 people on my email list. I'm like, that's fantastic. What are you, how are you nurturing them? What's the, what's the, how are you offering them? What's the sales funnel? What do you mean? What's the sales funnel? So it's like, they've done the no. great thing of by creating this like <laughs> list, but then they don't have a sales funnel, right? So I'm just like, no. So then profit pillar five is really about looking at what is your top of funnel? What's your mid of funnel? And what's your bottom of funnel? And how are you bringing them on that, you know, customer journey to conversion? So uh, yes, sales funnels is profit pillar number five. But what happens then, and for many of the solopreneurs out there is you're like, okay, I've, I've got this firing. The sales funnel's working. My email list building is working. I'm actually, you know, profitable now, uh, but I can't keep sustaining this on my own. So profit pillar number six is all about really thinking about how are you going to build your dream team? What are the, you know, what are those um, what systems and processes now need to be implemented in order for you to be no longer the employee of the, your business and start shifting you to that beautiful CEO of the business and so obviously you know are you gonna have to hire locally or internationally what's your budget to uh, um, outsource this stuff but you really need to start thinking about building that dream team in order to start scaling 
And the last profit pillar, profit pillar uh, number seven is all about productivity and profitability. So many businesses, again, that I work with is they are just doing all these tasks that they don't need to be doing when we start logging their time on Toggle, or they don't know their numbers. So they're not looking at Google Analytics to understand that Pinterest is their primary source of traffic coming to the website. And what could they be do utilizing with that to, to really double down? Could they be doing content upgrades? Could they be getting an email list at the bottom of their uh, uh, like have a beautiful opt-in at the bottom, whatever that is, right? And so if you don't understand your numbers, most people will stay stagnant at that five, six figure mark. But if you think about millionaires and these seven, eight figure business owners, that's what they do because they're in the CEO role is they're all about their numbers in order to be make fast and informed decisions for their business. So once you kind of build those other foundational profit pillars, the last one really is about ensuring that productivity and profitability. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. There's some good stuff there. And I love that how we're on the same page of like, you need your email list. You need a great converting blog. You need a sales funnel. Cause otherwise you're spending so much money on Facebook ads that are going nowhere and you're going to be stuck. So awesome. I love that. Um, what are some mistakes that you've made in business over the years or like a big failure that you've had and how did you get over that? So, yeah, so for me, other than like the third party logistics and not paying to play earlier is one of the things that I've learned just recently this year in 2019 is fail fast, but fire faster. Um, and so what I was doing is like I had hired um, this Facebook team. I was paying them 3000 US a month. So obviously manage my Facebook ads, which is a copious amount of money, right? Uh, I didn't always start there, right? I try to run ads myself and then you pay a little bit more and you take a course and now I've, I'm able to afford it. Uh, but yeah, so I was just going... And I've also made knowing Facebook ads my business. So even though it's not my zone of genius, I can still look at an ad set and be like, hey, do we need to do something with this and blah, 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 right? But th these particular people, they just weren't doing their job. But because it had been a referral to me, it's kind of like, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I, my expectations are too high. But no, they just were crap and they weren't doing their job. And I should have, you know, fired them faster uh, yeah. based on them not doing what they told me that they were going to do. So for me, it's fail fast, but fire faster is something that, again, I've really only picked up that concept in the last 12 months. Uh, what else? It, I would say ask for help. One of the lessons is that you try and do this on your own and you're Googling how to do this and you're going to YouTube to do this and you're going to Pinterest and then you try and stitch everything together. I genuinely believe that transformation happens after a transaction is complete. Yes. And until that transaction, regardless of how big or small it is, it could be $17, like you said, for one of your products, right? And that's okay. But the people become more accountable. People stand up, people take notice when they hand over their, their credit card. So to me is, again, not doing it alone and really being mindful that, again, the, the beauty and the blossoming and that uncomfortable and the growth will happen when you, you choose to invest in yourself. Totally. I like, I really truly believe that when people pay, they pay attention. So that's why mm -hmm. I never give away a course for free. I truly believe if someone invests in themselves, they're going to get that return on that investment, you know? So recently cool. I made a $10,000 investment to work with Frank Kern for the next eight weeks. And he mm -hmm. is like the marketing genius. So I'm like, I need to take advantage. So I'm like going all in and I'm like, how can I really make the most of this investment? If it was like 500 bucks or something, I wouldn't have taken it as seriously as I am right now, you know? 100%. And I find like the higher ticket, the more you spend, the more like, it's just you, like you said, you sit up and you're like, I got to make this work. Like this yeah. is like the, the, this failure is not an option, right? Like you're yeah. like, you're doubling in. And so yeah, just be mindful, but yeah, investing and yeah, just, it's okay to grow, you know, give yourself permission to grow, step into that and really don't, don't, I know that playing small and playing big is kind of a word that's being a buzzword I find for 2019, but I do think a lot of people are, they're just kind of like, there's that scare, they're scared of their fear. Fear is okay, but you know, lean into the fear because growth is on the other side. Yes. Ooh, so good. Okay. So you talked about the go-giver. Do you have another book that you love that you would recommend? Yeah. I also love the, uh, Traction is a new book that I've been reading. I'm going to mix up on the name of it. I'm horrible at the name, but Traction, it's this beautiful black and orange cover. And what it did is I started reading it actually a few years ago and I only got through the first couple chapters. Then I read it probably again a year after that and I got through half of it. Um, and it wasn't until recently when I was on the way to the Meldon 
archives for my mastermind with James Shremko that I had the book in my bag and I had downloaded one podcast to listen to on the flight from Brisbane to Singapore. And lo and behold, I finished the entire book traction on that flight from Brisbane to Singapore. And when I turned on the one podcast episode I had, which was actually with Jenna Kutchner, it was with her business coach talking about the book traction. Uh, it was the most bizarre, you know, I don't believe in coincidences, but I was like, what? This is like, again, it was meant to be, all right? But what Traction really talks about is what elements do you need to do in order to grow that business? And it's really big about your team and not hiring just to hire, but hiring people for the right tasks. Um, really looking at, he does a scorecard, looking at your own business and like, all there's all these questions that they ask. I just remember like, it's like opening chapter and I'm like, not doing that, not doing that, not doing that. But what he's saying is again, he's trying to get you in the mindset of being that CEO of your business. And these are the things that you're going to have to start doing. So regardless of your team, having regular team meetings, and it's something I do, but then there's other things like having the same agenda, like don't mess up, don't mess around with people's time. Just go in there, do the same agenda, rock and roll, giving your uh, contractors or your full-time staff. Uh, I think the word he uses is rocks. So they've got their own quarterly tasks and goals that they need to be achieving and contributing. Uh, he then looks at your team's core values, like your, your business core values, and then are your team relating to these core values when you hire them? So it was a beautiful book about how you gain that kind of next level traction. Again, I wish I could remember his name, but I can't a little bit too early in the morning for that. Um, but Traction is a great book. And I also love the book, The Purple Cow by Seth Godin. It really is about how can you be remarkable? And he talks about if you're driving in France and you're looking out the window and you see that these cows and everything just looks so beautiful but after a time white cows and brown cows and black cows they just become ordinary but if you saw a purple cow that would become remarkable yep. and how and so again how are you being the purple cow in your business how are you standing out so yes those would be my two I have traction in my bookshelf back there. So oh, I need, see, I, I'm I telling you, <laughs> I'm telling you, it sits on your bookshelf and then all of a sudden it just, I kept walking past my bookshelf and it was the only book that kept catching my eye. Yeah. And then I put it out on my suitcase and I thought, we're going to try this for the third time. But I was ready to then hear that information. I was ready because where I was in business and I think sometimes you're just not ready to hear it. Yeah. Whereas this time on the way to the Maldives, I was ready and it's, it's been phenomenal. Cool. What does it mean to you to make an impact? Yeah, impact is big. Uh, I was actually speaking on, we are podcast here in Australia with Pat Flynn and uh, uh, we were on the panel and it was about impacting and utilizing your podcast as that. And one of the things I had said was, well, Pat's got it and he's talking about like, I'm building schools and I'm doing this. And I was next to talk and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not building schools. Like I don't really have an impact, but Pat was really great. Actually. Uh, he had called me out and he just said, and I'm going to stop you here there like because I was saying so well I'm only on episode nine at that stage I'm only on and he's like no he's like but you're making an impact so it was thanks to Pat that I really had kind of looked at impact differently collectively in my business and if I think about impact is if you've got any type of platform in business you've got an opportunity to make an impact regardless if you think it's small it could be big to so many others and not to minimize that so impact for me is really uh, honing in on mental health for my business uh, mental health I'm a trained mental health clinician of 15 years working in adult mental health predominantly and mental health here in Australia eight people take their lives every single day and it is something that doesn't is it not it's not necessary and in, a, in America the, the numbers are so much higher because your population is so much bigger so for me is impact is being able to have a voice breaking down some of those stories and just letting people know that they're they're not alone so that's impact for me is a, yeah big or small you've got opportunity you've got a stage I love it where can we connect with you so yes, the best place to connect with me is just over on my website, which is angelahenderson.com.au. And depending on how you consume information, you can decide to listen to my podcast, join my Facebook group, uh, read my blog, whatever. So yes, I would just head straight to angelahenderson.com.au and yeah, and choose what works best for you right now in business. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for being on the show and adding so much value to our audience. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much. You have an awesome day.